Shall we? Shall we kick off? Brief introduction. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Okay. Can't can't see who and, and what, which is a bit disconcerting, but hope everyone good. Uh, I just I thought I'd sort of do a bit of intro, say a few words as to why we're here and why Mel and why Dr. Cole. Um, I met Mel four or five years ago initially. Probably. With Dave Wright. Um, I got talking about various bits uh, about a year ago. Um, started to pick up some of the work that was happening with cause. Um, I kind of, Mel's been involved in some um, good projects and got a, a track record in the industry for a long period of time. Uh, Cole is involved in uh, the underground training station with a friend of mine, Neil Parsley. Uh, so that he's actually, not only has he um, got the book smarts, he's also got the street smarts from a, from a training gym perspective. And I saw last year they were doing some stuff through, with cause around COVID. Um, and sort of uh, the, the health side of, of training. And I just took a note. And as this has sort of gone on and played out, I've, I've, I've kept track and um, we were looking for a solution for when we come back in for, for the coaches, to give the coaches confidence um, around some of the, 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 the specifically COVID um, side of stuff, um, but also to give our members um, reassurance that we, uh, we're on the ball and we've done everything we can in terms of um, looking after them and their best interest coming back into the gym um, after what has been a pretty, I was going to use the word unprecedented, but a pretty, pretty bumpy year. Um, so, and this just felt like the, the whole cause approach uh, content felt like a very good fit for the time. Um, and I think both from a sort of personal and professional standpoint, it would, it's exactly what we need as an industry, as operators at this time. So here we, here we find ourselves today on this sunny Friday afternoon. Yay, thanks. Thanks, JC. Thanks for having us. Thanks everybody for chiming on. I don't know where everyone else is, but it's gray and bleak where I am. Um, so yay for, for those for whom it's sunny. Um, doubly appreciate that everybody's dialed on today. It is Friday afternoon as a fellow business owner. I know this is the graveyard shift for our week um just just to frame things up and just explain a little bit more um following jc's kind intro as to who Colin and i are and what cause the uh, cause is um so mel spooner um i'm the md of cause as jc explained i've been in the fitness space for oh, probably about 15 years now and um, worked for various but started out in arps and then various brands technogym my zone part of part of dave's startup team for my zone and then part of the startup team for TRX in the UK and then moved on there from there to work with a few brands like Viper, Dynamax Medicine Balls, PT on the Net, PT Global, etc. Set my first company for the first time back in 2014 um, and then began working on Cause with Carl back in 2019. Um, Cause is an education company and we create content, courses and curricula specific to the needs of what it is that you guys as club operators and club owners and coaches tell us that they feel is missing, that that maybe with that in place helps them, the, them to be perform better at work, be, be more work ready when they enter the industry or as they progress through their career. Um, and as just to take a sort of a side step for a moment, as an industry and having been in and out of clubs kind of my whole career, we've all talked for so long about the recurring gaps that exist and some of the some of the education that we already have available. Um, and that, I don't mean that in a point in the finger way at anybody, but we can all agree that there's been certain things that coaches and clubs have asked for over time. And, and having worked in education for quite a period of time, I thought um, it was about time that rather than talk about it across panels that we started to work together to to create new content and meet those needs. So that was the purpose of Cause back in 2019. And um, of course, we all roll into 2020. And as JC said, that unprecedented time with COVID-19. Um, and with that whole theme and that whole notion of what we're about in mind, um, we sort of figured that there's going to be a whole host of questions, a whole host of populations that we would be dealing with um, as a result of the pandemic that would start to come to our club doors um, and come up with our personal trainers on a regular basis. And we wanted to be able to make sure that we helped to provide the content um, that helped clubs and coaches, as JC said, to be able to respond to those questions. Um, massive story short, we've become best known for providing a course now 
called Rebuild, um, which helps trainers and coaches to uh, learn how to rehabilitate individuals from COVID-19 and long COVID. Um, and with the help of JC, UK Active, Europe Active, EMD, etc., we've been able to mobilise between us all a network of around 450 clubs and coming up to about 4,000 coaches to be able to rehabilitate individuals up and down the country from COVID-19 and long COVID. Um, this work isn't just um, based in the UK. This is, this is work that we're replicating on, on other continents with other colleagues across the world that we'll all be familiar with. Um, key question that we get asked a lot is how is it that we have access to information that we can provide to you guys to help you understand how to deal with a lot of the new questions that are coming our way with regards to COVID-19 and long COVID. So at this point, it makes utter sense to introduce you to my fellow co-founder, Dr. Carl Robertson, who will explain uh, his background a little and um, talk you through how it is that we are able to access this kind of information for you. Thanks, Mel. Thanks, JC. I will, I'll keep this brief, folks. I don't want to bore you to death with my kind of life story. But yeah, my name's Dr. Cole. And I'm a exercise physiologist. I've worked everything from clinical exercise physiology. So helping people to recover from successful treatments for cancer, cardiovascular disease, pulmonary stroke, you know, across that full board, working in a large district general and community trust, all the way through to helping athletes prepare for the Olympic Games, climb Mount Everest, row across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, but really more recently, I spend my time as, as as primarily a researcher. So research has always been a part of what I've done. And I've been very fortunate to be based at some big research institutes over the years. But I was like working as S&C, even though my background back in the 90s was as a PT, but working a lot in S&C in pro and elite sport, continuing to work in health, but all the while through keeping that research link. But really over the past 10 years, it's become more and more research. And the reason why we are so plugged in, I guess, to what's going on with regards to this and because of the research networks that I play an active role in. So I'm currently a part of the GM Health Innovations Research Team, where my primary areas in that are looking at how exercise and nutrition bolsters successful treatments for people who are undergoing um, procedures for cancer. I'm part of the city's change in diabetes strategy, which is a global initiative. Again, looking at how in exercise and nutrition brings about improved status or reversibility of type two diabetes, part of Cheshire Active. So look at infrastructure with regards to how we can change our spaces to promote people to be more actively engaged, do more physical activity. And currently I'm a part of the advanced clinical practice group working with Health Education England with regards to the post COVID-19 scenario. And that's in two counts really. So that's looking at how we can ready and prep the whole medical area and the therapy area to better understand what a person is going through once they've had COVID-19 and how they can foster that initial, that acute rehabilitation and know how to hand that over successfully to the fitness industry. But also looking at the fact that what COVID-19 has made the world aware of is that too many people are living with comorbidities chronic illness and disease is rife and we need to look at preventative and we need to look at investing more in those proven pathways of of changing outcomes and exercise is at the heart of that there is an agreement there's an agreement all over the uk all over the world that the biggest difference we can make to people's quality of life when they're living with cardiovascular issues cancer copd all these kind of things is how we can best structure physical activity and exercise in order for them to have better outcomes and better quality of life. So I'm embedded a lot in all of that. I, I kind of class myself as a knowledge broker, which has been able to access the peer review, although I still actively research and create some of the peer reviewed research. I access it on behalf of those institutions so that we can take best evidence and put it into practice. Because all too often, there's a huge separation. There's this growing body of evidence over here and a lot of academic people coming to agreements, but very little that impact over here, front, front and center, in the trenches, changing people's lives. And that's really what I do is provide a bridge across that, whether it's exercise or nutrition, how we can do things better 
working in the education space, I have PhD students, MSc students up and down the country and around the world. And so when it came to putting together this program, you know, we took a very, um, a very strong approach with regards to the notion of how we were going to construct a course that was engaging. It's a spiral curriculum. It builds on itself always with the output being better practice, understanding that improves practice. So that's what we tried to create through the course. And that's my part in it. Back to you, Mel. Perfect. Um, just to preface the rest of the session as well, guys, obviously we're an education company and we have education and we have education around COVID, but this isn't a sales pitch. So this is an awareness exercise based off kind of conversational between Colla, JC, and, and hopefully with some questions from you guys at the end to bring you up to speed on the work that's being done on your behalf, to give you top level information that you're gonna to wanna to know going into April. And then there's some stuff at the end that you guys can all be doing now, whether it is that you're a club partner with us or, or not. Um, so to start to provide some of that context, Carl is just gonna talk us through, um, when it comes to COVID-19 now and long COVID, what's the scale of the problem and what does that mean for us? So as most of you will know, and, and I keep very close to this with regards to the epidemiology of what's going on and also the developments with regards to the vaccine and the virology part of it. This is a global pandemic. Currently to date, we've got 120 million confirmed cases. So that's not through self-report, that's through confirmed cases through either hospital admissions or positive tests. So in reality, we know the number is greater because there is a huge part of the population populations that will be symptomatic, stay at home, ride it out, not engage directly or formally with their GP practice or a hospital. They'll just deal with their symptoms and then kind of start to pick themselves back up. So this 120 million is a huge number in itself, but this is really only revealing a part of the, of the problem, of the situation. The same way as throughout the early part of this and all the way up until Christmas last year, the headline was really hitting home to us, the mortalities, the death rate. We were constantly getting told the death rate, confirmed cases and death rate. And what we have to bear in mind is the COVID-19 for the vast majority of people is not a fatal virus. Any one death is a death too many. So please, I'm not trying to undermine that or soft sell that. But if from the vast majority, in fact, the global survival rate as we stand today is 96%. And that fluctuates a little bit, it, you know, it, it lowered actually at the start of the winter season, but we're around about 96% success rate globally. And that's remarkable. But don't get lost in that because the problem that we're all waking up to and that we've been addressing really now for the best part of at least 11, 12 months is that it's not a virus that just comes and goes for most people either. So we've got everything from people who will experience their symptoms and start to Put themselves back together all the way through to those groups who are being more severely impacted and where that's taken us and where we're at in the present day so these numbers are just a clear indication to the fact that this is global numbers are rising this is purely confirmed this these numbers sorry are purely confirmed through hospital admissions and positive tests and we're going to see this grow and grow and grow because more people are being tested and we're still getting a lot of hospital admissions so when it comes down to those two categories, we have those who've been hospitalized and we know there's been a, a scale of trauma for those people because they have been ventilated. There'll be a number of issues with regards to the, the extent of their immobility. And also if they had comorbidities, you know, we know for a fact that people are developing pneumonia, are having cardiovascular events, are having strokes. So the, 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 the real deep end of this is severe it really really is and personally i don't feel like enough of that gets talked about forget the fatalities for a moment it's the the trauma that people are experiencing within that environment that aren't related to deaths so we've got those people and they're going to once successful they're going to progress through undergo some level of clinical rehabilitation and maybe some community rehabilitation and then they're going to be back in the community and they are going to benefit from some structured input and support. The second group, which is the biggest group, are the non-hospitalized. 
And they can have reasonably severe symptoms, but not such that they needed to go to hospital or they can be asymptomatic. But what we're seeing across that is that arguably there's a different type of risk, which in some instances we should consider more seriously, because if you've been hospitalized, we know the trauma because you've been under that kind of scrutiny and watchful eye. That person is going to present with a whole ton of information with regards to what they've undergone and what happened to them. But it's the same virus and we know how the virus affects various parts of the system. When someone's not been hospitalized, there's all too easily the assumption to go, okay, you're no longer symptomatic. You're all right. Let's move on. And we can't, we've got to, we've really got to be cautious about that because what we're seeing in increasing numbers, first of all, are people who are saying they've got post-viral fatigue. It's taken them five days, 10 days to really start to shake it off. And they're struggling to get back to where they were previously. And then there's this even more worrying group to a certain extent that's growing day by day, which is what we call long COVID. And with just less than two weeks ago, long COVID was formally recognized as a syndrome. And as a syndrome, what that means is there is a sufficient amount of symptoms, consistent symptoms, that if a person has enough of them at any one time, regardless of severity, then it qualifies as a diagnosable syndrome. And the latest evidence on that, which I can share with you, is it's likely currently that there's going to be three different interpretations of that syndrome, two of which are going to be with regards to that alignment of symptoms and one will be more focused on severity of symptoms. The third syndrome in this is for somebody who's pre uh, condition, their underlying condition prior to having COVID-19 was something of an autoimmune nature, perhaps ME, fibromyalgia. And for that group, exercise is discouraged. Okay, so it, for that group, exercise is discouraged or it's gonna be something that features much further down the road. So it's really important that if somebody presents to you and says that they've had COVID-19 and they've they previously have been dealing with ME, fibromyalgia, or some level of autoimmune, that you should say, I can help you with structuring some physical activity that's going to assist your activities of daily life. You can help that individual with regards to their nutritional choices for sure but you shouldn't start moving that person towards structured exercise. It's really important that you recognize that. For the other two groups of people who've had long COVID, and for those groups of people, which is a huge group, who are just really struggling to shake off the virus, okay? They're not long COVID, but they're really struggling to shake off the virus. We can commence, particularly if we're past any kind of considerations of acute clinical rehabilitation which for the vast majority of these people won't have even featured as a part of their pathway. We can commence. We have to be the pace limit and step. We have to go steadily. We have to avoid boom and bust because you can't work against fatigue. So we've got to be really careful about how we do it, but we, we should start doing it as soon as we possibly can to, in order to support these people to overcome it so that we can, I mean, post-viral fatigue is nothing new. People have been dealing with post-viral fatigue for eons, but in the context of COVID-19, we are seeing that it's a, it's a little bit more pronounced. And some of those symptoms that were, are common to long COVID and even just those who are just finding it difficult to shake off the virus itself are things like breathlessness, even by engaging in quite relatively easy activities, increased rest and heart rate, joint pain, difficulty with sleep, brain fog, difficulty with concentration, um, state of low mood, depression, anxiety, um, still getting periodic, periodical fever-like sensations. So it's good that if a person's not received any kind of indication that, that they might have long COVID, that if someone reports this to you and says, not only can they not shake it off, but it seems to be getting worse, that you encourage that person to speak to their GP about the symptoms that they're experiencing, okay? Because we can, I promise you, we as an industry, as a fitness industry, can make the biggest difference here for the long run. We really, really can, because more and more people are going to need our support, our expertise and our guidance than ever. And most of them don't know it yet. And that's why we need to really raise the profile of the conversation and make sure that people are aware that we are here for them. But we've got to do it the right way. Getting this right is all the difference that counts, is all the difference that matters.
Okay, so with that, Carl just talked then about being the limiting pace and the role that we can have in that. There are two super common missteps that people who contracted COVID-19 will make. Um, they'll have, they'll start to, to, to feel a sense of normality and assume they're kind of good to go and to kick back into normal daily life. So they massively overestimate their readiness to return to the normal pace of life, normal pace of work, normal level of fitness intensity. And with that, of course, they underestimate the level of recovery they need post virus. You've heard Carl talk through some of the level of damage that a person can experience because of the virus. And of course it needs a level of time. The system needs a level of, of time to bounce back from that. Um, a, a handy analogy that we often use with people when we're talking to groups of individuals that experience COVID is to say it's akin to breaking your leg and then going for a run on it the next day. Like we just absolutely wouldn't do it, would we? But because of the COVID situation, because it's less visible, because a person can't lift up their own hood, it's hard for them to see, especially as Carl said, in the event that they haven't been hospitalized to see what's taken place. So by pushing too hard too soon, they're creating um, a, a more difficult problem for themselves in the present moment, but it can also lead to the onset of long COVID. So as Carl said, not only for us as a, as a sector, not only is our role, not only are we able to, to drive awareness of this and by explaining to our clients and members um, this level of advice and awareness, we can prevent them taking the sustained symptom path and the long COVID path but we can also use exercise to help to rehabilitate them quicker and more effective going forward. There's a couple of screen grabs on the screen um, and I apologize because if you guys are viewing on the phone, you might just need to kind of zoom in a little bit to see these, these in full. Um, we have a page on our website um, which has got a form on it that if you've experienced COVID-19 or you're struggling with long COVID, you can complete the details of the form we'll check out where you're based, we'll go through a person's story and then we'll connect them to one of our clubs or coaches that have gone through our program so that they can receive the help that they need. These images and um, the, the descriptions that you see on screen give you a little bit of an insight into the sort of scenarios that you might expect some of your members or clients to have faced. In both instances, I think you can see that um, they have a history of exercise and they're both pretty young people as well. But that just helps to kind of bring um, some reality to the situation, and kind of put a bit of, bit of a human lens on it as well. Um, we talked at the beginning about some of the partners as well as JC and, and that we've been working with, so UK Active, Europe Active, etc. At the core of what we do, we're obviously an education company um, and we put these, these courses out, we put the, pro the COVID programme out um, out of obligation more than anything else to help our sector and help clubs and coaches to respond to what was going on. Um, but a few things happened um, that escalated our role in this COVID um, environment. Number one, the number of, well, to take a step back, when we released the programs, it was pre, we were putting them together before we reopened in July, okay? Mm -hmm. So we were thinking this is going to be a short-term thing that can help you guys to respond in this first phase. Of course, since then, the situation continued to escalate. We've already seen the case count in terms of the number of people who've had COVID. Case count rocketed. Um, the, the, the complications around the virus, long COVID as a syndrome, all of that started to come to the fore. And because Carl and I had been working in this domain since April, we were being called upon by our industry, by our strategic partners, UK Active, Europe Active, et cetera, to, to, be, a, to be a spokesperson on this for our sector and to provide up to the minute information and detail that would help you guys as we navigate our way through the COVID situation. And then also on the other side of that, um, we've just seen some of those entries that we've received from people who are dealing with COVID. We're part of a number of groups now that have got tens of thousands of individuals in them who have experienced scenarios like that that you just read on screen. And legitimately, when we read those stories, when we speak to those groups, we cannot help but want to help these people and connect them to more clubs and coaches to get the advice and 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 the rehabilitation that they need. 
So as a result of that, um, our role as an education company grew beyond the traditional realms of education and training. And we started to represent us all um, and a number of our strategic partners in the topic of um, COVID-19. What you see on screen at the moment is a, a collection of the groups that are actively working on COVID-19 recovery plans, research, funding, rehabilitation. They include us as a collective group, which is represented bottom right by the fitness industry task force. That's what I refer, that's how we refer to that, that mobilized network of clubs and coaches that are already active and delivering rehabilitation now across the country. Carl mentioned before his role within the advanced clinical practice panel with Health Education England. And of course, the government and the NHS are doing their part. And we've all read about um, the COVID-19 recovery hubs, et cetera, that have started to pop up across the UK. But when we looked at this slide, probably back in November time, it, it was very fragmented. There was no real kind of joined up thinking, no real cohesion necessarily between government research groups and what we were doing as a sector. As a quick snapshot update of that, this is all obviously very illustrative and a bit of a graphical gesture, um, but you can see how we've all come together as a much closer group. Everybody is collaborating at a bigger level. Um, Cole can speak to in, in a little in a little moment about how much more, I guess, receptive the healthcare is being as a result of the additional pressure that COVID-19 has placed on it. Um, but what we have certainly started to see in the last couple of months in terms of, in terms of this improved joined up thinking is there's a bigger awareness and a bigger acceptance already that our sector and our clubs are able, willing, competent and confident to receive people who need help. Um, we've also started to see for our coaches that are out there promoting what it is that they're doing, kicking off with their outreach, that GPs have heard of cause, they've heard of the certification they've gone through, physios have heard of the certification that the guys have gone through. So the awareness of our role in this is already picking up. The biggest crime that is one of the challenges that we're, that, that Colin and I and, and we as a company are continuing to fight against is that the general population aren't being told that they need to take it easy if they've experienced COVID-19 or they're, or they're experienced long COVID now. They're not, being, they're not being told to the extent at which they need to manage their recovery. And so we're doing as much as we can to try and campaign for that consumer awareness and as part of that and the work that we do with UK Active um, in the phase two of our campaigning with, with UK Active we're going to drive much harder again that consumer awareness piece but also the lobbying for government endorsement purely because we want more of the population who are in a desperate position to know that you guys are a go-to in their community to get the help that they need. Um, anything else from a more kind of official or institutional perspective you want to add to that, Carl? No, I mean, that's the key thing is for, probably for the first time, it's really welcome that the, the more medical clinical sector have been proactive. And first of all, identifying that the space that the majority of this needs to happen is the fitness space, that this needs to happen within the gyms, within the leisure services. That's where the skill set is. That's where the facilities are. And also it's about breathing a mentality of continued compliance so that this is a way that people should start to take accountability towards owning their own health and, and taking this for the long term. Because a 12-week, a generic 12-week rehab program is not going to fix this. And also, the, as I alluded to earlier on, there are bigger issues at place. We do need to get people back on track with conversations about managing their weight more effectively, reducing their risk of comorbidities and chronic illnesses, and, and managing that more proactively as we roll forward. So really, in amongst all of this mess that we've had to deal with, what's coming forward is a way in which, or a change in the way in which health is done, particularly real health when you go to the hospital it's because you're sick health happens before it or afterwards so real health moving forward the collaboration that's required 
you know, we've spent a lot of time dwelling on fitness industry, needing to understand the language of the clinician, of the therapist, but they are now starting to embrace the notion that they need to understand our language too, so that those referrals, those recommendations are clearer, more efficient, and also to address this notion of a postcode lottery. So that no matter where you are in the UK, you benefit from the same level of access to continued support, and supervision and acute rehabilitation in the wake of all this that has gone on. Because the only way that we're really going to affect change in the long run is to make people more accountable for their own health and wellness. So really, from a kind of a, a more organizational point of view, more and more people are starting to come together at the table. And it's starting to link up with regards to where expertise exists and how far that should spread across and what it should influence. So it's been a long time coming. And you might say it's taken a global pandemic, a disaster to make it happen. But that's where we're at. OK, we, we, we've reached an 11 hour, an 11th hour, and this is where we're at now. So things are moving forward really, really positively. Everybody's recognizing and requires the same outcome. So, in terms of ways potentially that you guys could get involved with this, not just to support clients and members and the people that need help, but also to support your business, um, we put together this little slide. We mentioned that we wanted to help you to respond to questions from clients and members, but as fellow business owners, we wanted to also help clubs to be able to survive and look at new services, new programmes and new ways to generate revenue. We talked just now about this uh, sector skills task force and what we mean by that is coaches that are certified to be able to deliver COVID-19 rehabilitation. So once one of our coaches um, has gone through our certification, there's then this whole remit of individuals and relationships that they ought to let know that they're now in a position to receive individuals that need help. Um, and I'm just going to talk to each of those quickly now. So. When a club or a coach gets certified, the first thing that they're going to do is tell the clients and members they already serve that they are ready to receive those that need help, start to communicate some of the key talking points that we've talked about today to start to share awareness and also massively position you guys and restate yourselves as the leader in their fitness and their health promotion. Um, Within that, and we won't go too much down this, this rabbit hole at the moment, there's certain implications that you're going to want to think about from a group training perspective and having individuals return to club, recommencing group training that may still be dealing with the wake of the virus. And we can, we can share some information separately with JC on that. We did a presentation for EMD UK last week to about kind of a thousand um group exercise instructors to address some of the concerns that they had that, that may well be of interest to you guys. So we'll make sure you get a copy of that. Um, no doubt a lot of you guys will already be delivering one-to-one -one or personal training services on site. Um, if you've got clients and members who don't currently engage in PT, providing one-to-one -one rehab for COVID rehabilitation is obviously a natural segue slash gateway into personal training with members who've previously not considered it. So that's kind of our existing audiences, our existing population. And of course, that's, that applies to digital communities as well as to those who come through our doors. Also bear in mind, we've got a whole community around us that may have never had a gym membership period, or they may never have had a gym membership with us. There's a whole host of people outside our doors that have experienced COVID-19 that are looking out for help. Um, and or individuals in the community who know another person, whether it's a relative or a friend, that needs help. Um, we've had a lot of our certified coaches pick up a ton of referrals from friends and family because I can't emphasize enough um, the appetite and kind of the desire um, for people to get the guidance that it is that they're looking for. And sort of as a testament to that, I mentioned the form on our website where people send inquiries direct to us. When we then issue those out to a coach, we've had a 100% conversion with those. So any introduction that's been made, every single individual has signed up for for one-to-one -one or something similar. Um, so it's a different type of referral this time. In terms of primary care and community rehab, um, we suggest kind of once individuals and once a club is comfortable talking around this topic a little, to start to knock on the doors of local GPs, healthcare practitioners, 
etc etc to let them know that you are ready willing and able to receive referrals through um again by way of example our first ever uh, course graduate knocked on the door of his gp explained what it is that he'd been through and he received 22 referrals straight away um we work with ipswich council for example um they've been really proactive and advised their local um there's an abbreviation for everything isn't it uh, ccgs ahps um gps um as well as even their covid19 recovery recovery hub that's most local to them ipswich hospital they've even got some of the physios at the recovery hub in the hospital also going through the program so they can all speak the same language with people across the community so there's a real openness there where in the past for some of us for some clubs we've kind of had that door shut in our face schools colleges and universities and um, so this isn't just um uh, limited to like dual use facilities etc and um, but we noticed very early on that we were receiving inquiries from schools higher education facilities where students and staff had experienced COVID and they didn't know what to do. Um, we have actually started to have schools and PE staff sign up to go through the education so that they can deliver stuff on campus, but that's not realistic for every type of school. Um, so there's a real opportunity again from a community outreach perspective to start to provide services in those sorts of environments. Um, and then similarly, uh, corporate rehab, We've been doing a corporate outreach since the dawn of time um, as a sector, and sometimes that's well received and sometimes it's harder than we'd like. Um, but it's a little bit, again, it's a little bit different now. We've Again, we've got a little video on YouTube, which I'll send to JC, um, but employers have this sense of duty of care. Their staff are out, they've been out long-term, not only like physical um, health issues, but also mental health issues, and they want to be able to provide support. So again, it's kind of, it's a more approachable scenario than it has been before. Um, just, just as a company, Col and I, we've done presentations for um, clinical health nurses, and we've just had an inquiry from the Met Police to go in and deliver a session for those guys to help drive awareness on this. So you can kind of see the interest from everybody to understand is huge. And another thing that you provide in delivering information about this is a sense of control for everybody because they have a better understanding of what's going on and a better understanding of how to deal with it. This is a little video that I won't play. You're not gonna be able to do it, Nick. Mainly because it's 10 minutes long. Um, but again, I'll make sure the link comes through to you guys, to JC. The video is of Jan. Um, Jan is our long COVID icon. Um, she got COVID back in March 2020. She was previously super fit, you know, in a prime. She'd been doing CrossFit five times a week, etc. cetera. Um, her COVID situation escalated. She almost had a stroke. Um, had a series of cardiovascular events, um, was struggling to go back to work, on the verge of depression, etc. Um, she started working with our first ever cause graduate at the end of November. Um, last month, she was completely recovered from her long COVID situation. Um, and to reiterate how uncomplicated that had to be, um, the coach in his feedback said he didn't have to he didn't have to reinvent anything that he did. He just took what he already knew, added our base fundamentals of the course to that and was able to attack the scenario through this COVID lens to walk her back through recovery safely. They're now continuing to work together. So again, new client situation to take her through her decondition phase because obviously she's not done a great deal for the last year. Um, and then once they're through the decondition phase, then they can resume what might be more of a normal traditional personal trainer relationship um, but there's some really useful insights in terms of a case study example that you can take from that video um, okay to start to bring things towards the Q&A we mentioned at the beginning we wanted to give you guys um, some nuggets that you could take away now so Carl is going to kick off by talking through the three things that you can do now for free yes 
Start with the limiting pace. Um, this is huge. It really is. Mel mentioned it earlier on. And particularly for fit people. So fit people, previously fit people, have this expectation of themselves and the fitness they want to return to. They've got a previous training experience and idea that you push hard, you work hard, you overcome a limitation. And that's just going to send people backwards. And in fact, at the other end of what I do, dealing with some of the pro athletes and the elite athletes, that's been a real issue for us with those, those girls and guys who've had COVID-19 and then struggling to get back to fitness and full training because they keep going, trying to push, push, push too hard. And it really does send things backwards. So what we need to do right from the start, if a person reports to you that they've had COVID-19, whether they are long COVID or not, is to reset expectations and go, okay, we're going to establish a new foundation for fitness. We are going to develop our exercise tolerance, our aerobic capacity. We are going to look at that kind of functional factors and movement accuracy and some specific strength testing. And we're going to start to build up gradually. And the best thing you can do is prescribe and recommend activity that is beneath what you think they're capable of. But have the conversation first. You've got to realign those expectations because people will disengage and they'll go back to that format of wanting to push hard to overcome it. You can't work against fatigue. You can only work with it. And it's fatigue we're talking about, not acute tiredness. So we've got to set the pace, okay? We've got to lay out the roadmap, explain to people, here's how and why we're going to do it. We're deliberately going to go easy to begin with, and we're going to reestablish and build up that tolerance so that we can go from restoration through rehabilitation back to the progress. But we can't go to progress. Mel again made that, made that analogy, that metaphor earlier on. If you've had a broken leg, you're not just going to take the cast off and run a marathon. You've still got to repair the tissue. Then we'll rehabilitate, and then we'll start to progress. Getting this right means we can refocus on all the fitness outcomes that you want. Getting this wrong is not only going to delay the situation, but in the worst instances, make it worse. Listen, this is a huge one. Listen to me. No, but we do. We need to listen. You know, people are dealing with hyperphobia. There's a real concern about coming back to our spaces with regards to a sanitary point of view, risk of infection point of view. People are concerned about just going back to what we like to call normal, being around busy places and being around lots of people again. Also, people have had varying types of experiences of this. It can have affected them from a societal point of view, relationship point of view, financially, as well as pathologically if they've dealt with it. So we've got to be ready to listen. And a key part of our initial assessment when people return to our spaces is to make sure we understand where that individual is coming from so that we can really put things together that's going to endorse and, and promote their success and their continued participation. Through these two steps are really a way for us to reprove our industry as well. A lot of people over the past 12 months have come to the idea that they can exercise effectively without us. We've got to reprove ourselves as an industry. We've got to show our value. And our key part of our value is that we can be objective and that we can determine better routes towards fitness and goals than a person can figure out for themselves. And that comes off understanding the pace to set and our observations, our assessments and listening is the key art to effective assessments. So make sure that we do, we are receptive to that there's a huge factor which we don't have time to delve into but there is a huge factor with regards to post-traumatic stress disorder in the context of COVID-19 especially for those who have been hospitalized but even amongst those who've just dealt with severe symptoms on their own at home in isolation so let's be sensitive to it and you need to be looking into your little black books your notebooks and seeing if somebody discloses something to me that is beyond my capacity to deal with that's more than just a reassuring conversation who can you refer to who can you signpost to who is your go-to person to encourage them to go and consult with if you don't know one start to look start to reach out network and see who that might be because this might be a, an integral part of what we provide um and then lastly 
Another potentially simple one to, to start to think about is client assessments. Um, I would imagine that everybody listening runs client assessments already with their clients. Um, of course, coaches that go through our programme, we prescribe specific assessments that they would do with an individual post COVID-19. But that's not to say that you couldn't run any of the client assessments that you usually would with your clients now the chances are high that you will be able to then ever if they then experience COVID-19 and you run that same set of assessments again post-COVID you're going to have an indicator of what before COVID looked like and what post-COVID looked like so you have something tangible in front of them to show them an effect of what they've experienced but even if they haven't experienced COVID-19 What's super powerful and what a lot of our coaches have also decided to do is assess everybody because you're allowing your clients to take control and giving them the message that, hey, look, as far as your fitness and health is concerned, I've got you. Let's run these assess let's run these tests and assessments on you right now. Then in the event that something happens, we've got something to refer back to. But then I also kind of know where you're at at the moment. Um, and where our coaches have started to roll that out with their groups, that's just been super well received and also been like a nice kind of reset, as Carl said, kind of nice reset, reprove and reminder um, for the clients we're already working with too. Okay. Um, opening up to... Um, any q a from jc or anybody listening um carl would you have a look in the q a box as bits come through i will so we'll far the tricky one jc sorry mel i missed that one i said hit us with a tricky one well to be honest i'm sitting here and, and as a as an overall observation and i'm sure i'm not the only one i, I was sort of thoroughly wrapped up in the return of the opening of the gym. And I think it's very easy to forget that because I've personally been largely unaffected and the people that are also very excited and very vocal have been for the most part unaffected. There is a, there is a, there is a danger that we, we forget where we're, what we're currently in the midst of. And that there are people whom this has been quite serious and who've, who've been through a tough time and are going to need some genuine support on the other side. And I, and I think I certainly, would have to hold my hand up and say that I'd perhaps missed that through the sort of the fast pace, you know, rush to reopen and, and just get, kind of get back into play. Um, and, I, and I've, it's sort of been a, a very useful sort of sit down, take a breath, have a think and, you know, genuinely think about how you piece this together for those that, that genuinely are going to need your support. As Carl, do you describe well, don't you? We live in a here, we live in a bit of a COVID bubble, obviously, because we work in this day in, day out. But it's definitely true that if you are fortunate that you've not experienced COVID yourself and your loved ones haven't, then you won't have necessarily been exposed to a lot of what we see. That's right. And also I sh I, I share the sentiment, you know, because we're readying ourselves to reopen our gym and maybe we're slightly unique given what my involvement in all of this and, and the work that I do, but it's really easy to get really focused on the, the spaces, the procedures, the welcoming everyone back and telling everyone how great it's going to be. And we're going to get stuck in and all the usual way that we communicate. But the reality is, is in amongst our own populations, those return and, and those who might come to us for the first time. Now there are going to be considerable numbers, percentages of people who are coming from a more kind of vulnerable place. And, and we need to be receptive to that. And I think a part of that, JC, that I keep telling everyone is that we, we've we got a new identity to emerge into as a fitness industry post-COVID. We, we have to address the health issue more. That has to become a real part of our target again, as it used to be. And because of that, it's going to attract those type of people because that's the goal they're looking for. That's the outcome is a health outcome and not necessarily a personal best or a gain. So yeah, it's, 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 I appreciate the feedback. We need to put it really on the radar for everyone. Mm. And, and it's sort of the, the, the inquiries or members asking questions has sort of come in phases a bit if that and whether this holds true i'm not sure 
but initially a lot of the inquiries we received or our coaches received was from like endurance athletes or you know like try like weekend triathletes and Ironmen, etc cetera, etc cetera, who were pissed because obviously you're not able to achieve your normal level of performance your performance is is tracking back and they kind of want to pick that back up so that's what's raised the question so we've had that population start to put their hand up a lot then similarly if it's someone that's super into the fitness maybe trains four plus times a week um of, of all levels whether that's running lifting crossfit etc though those guys have started to come to the fore because again they're like my training's off my training is a, a huge integral part of my life this is pissing me off what's going on i need to better understand it um, and now more and more we're having the general population who maybe aren't as tuned in to themselves as people like from a body perspective as people who train that often putting their hands up and ask questions. Um, and then just in the last couple of weeks, there's been this fourth wave of people that haven't had COVID, but they've started to get an understanding of what it is that some of our coaches are doing. And they've started to ask for help because they might have had problems for a long period of time with say asthma, but they understand kind of, oh, well, I know that guy's kind of, or that girl's kind of good with that. So I'm gonna pose that question at them now. So there's certainly patterns emerging as well. And, and it could be that, that you guys experience the same thing. Um, but I think it also obviously will probably depend on what type of facility it is that you're running. Yeah, I, mean, I think here most people most people have highly engaged communities, and we for the for the most part they do group personal training. So it's not not one to one, but it's not very large group stuff either. And I think what sort of slapped me in the face is is this, that all the people that we're going to listen to, the first wave of people back into our types of gyms, are going to be the super enthusiastic, largely unaffected bunch, and and they're not the ones that you know we're going to have to kind of do the sort of we're safe we're trustworthy, you know, social distancing, our members are also going to follow the rules type stuff, which is what we've been talking about. But there's a whole sort of, you know, there's a, there's a whole sort of, there's another layer of customer, isn't there, if you want, for want of a better word, that we're going to have to do a very good job of repositioning ourselves and getting the message out to. And I think from a, you know, to pull it back to the commercials a bit, we're going to have to sort of think about our marketing or messaging, how we reach those people in a way that because in, in lots of ways, we're going to have to sort of turn some of the traditional, what has been of late, the traditional fitness industry messages on their head, you know, hard workouts, you know, intensity and all the rest of it. It's a massive opportunity for us, not just, you know, in the, in the immediate time, but for, for the industry as a whole to sort of, to, to put ourselves across differently. Mm. De de definitely. You know, this keeps cropping up, you know, statistically for the past 25 years, the fitness industry hasn't changed. 12 to 14 percent of the population take part that's it and we just get that turnover that natural attrition which is criminal when you when given the fact that every single human would benefit from from physical activity and exercise and better nutrition choices so i think that this is i guess we're always looking for a way to to get that message and to speak to people on the terms that, that, that they expect to be spoken on and set a new standard and, and make a different offer and assure them that we're sincere about it. And that to me is one of the, the more positive outcomes I think that we can salvage from this situation is that we've legitimately with credibility got an opportunity to have that type of conversation and make that offer and say to people, come to us for this. We're not going to you know, show you all the things that you can't do. We're not going to make you feel awful and break you in the first session. It's actually all about helping you to achieve those goals that matter to you. And I think now with the spotlight that's on us, we really do have a quite a unique opportunity to do that with integrity. I think previously when people have tried it, some people had suspicion about it. They thought, no, you just want to take me into a fitness fanatic. But I think now by recognizing it's something we need to do, we can actually do it well and do it earnestly. There is a question coming. So would we look at integrating the new layer of customer into our existing product? That's a question for you. You that Mel. Um. Well, I think it depends on what your existing product is, if you get what I mean. Um. And feel free to expand on that in the question box. But if I understand you correctly, a good way of looking at it is, if if I'm assuming that by new customer we mean someone that's had COVID, let's say. So if you guys are already living one to one or PT, it's the same. It's just in the context of COVID-19. And again, the analogy that we use with coaches is it's the same as if 
you did a pre and postnatal course and then you started working with people that were pregnant. It's a similar kind of thing. So operationally, a ton of stuff doesn't change. Relationship wise doesn't change. It's more around the programming and the activity prescription that comes after it. Um, if you only work with people in groups, then that can require a bit more thinking because depending on how you manage those groups or, or alter and modify class to suit each individual within that environment, it may be, and we've talked about in previous group style sessions, haven't we, Cole? It may be that you have to create a breakout group that's separate, that's more of, you wouldn't call it the COVID group clearly, but more of the COVID group and then more of your traditional group um, and then without completely overcomplicating it, there will be instances potentially from a COVID perspective that someone might need such a specific level of care that you couldn't categorize them with others in the group just yet. So it may be that there's a one-to-one -one element, then they progress into this group category, and then they start to funnel into what it is that you would normally offer and provide as a facility and I guess and tell me to, to shut up if this is off call but I guess the same sort of principles would be applied if that was a key uh, group of individuals that were dealing with cancer that you were working with a similar sort of protocol may apply um go on no it is similar I'm just going to say the, an example at, at our gym we're gonna we've got a new membership type offer that we're putting in place for this and also a different class so we want to set up a class that is ready to capture it that doesn't say covid we've actually called it rebuild and it's going to be set at an intensity um limited numbers so that the coach can do better jobs of observations and feedback limiting the intensity that people can either participate in forever so it will be naturally you know it, it will evolve and be naturally progressive but within those types of parameters or it could be just a, a, an opportunity people use to develop that initial level of recovery and fitness and move on to other things by the same gesture we're bringing in a type of membership recognizing there'll be people who come to us that they don't want to do those harder more intense sessions that type of training they really want to do stuff that's bespoke to just towards health outcomes to facilitate in those kind of aspects so we're bringing in a membership for that mm. uh, it kind of depends really like if you want to keep it simple it ought to be super easy to slip into the systems that you already have or if we want to go down the doing well out of doing good route and setting up a different type of service or a different type of program with its own price point and that can obviously lead to other opportunities and um, typically what we do when we're working with our club partners is we offer we answer questions on that and kind of offer advice on that and often will one of our club partners will send us say for example um customer journeys or when we have one of our regular bi-weekly club partner calls this sort of topic comes up and people kind of share best practice and talk around those between us and we'll offer advice on, for example, existing GP referral pathways and that kind of thing, and whether it's easy to slot in. So, so we can offer some guidance on that as well, um, based on what we know already from the industry, but also what we know others are offering as well and what is working. But I guess just to give, um, again, just another idea, some of the, the clubs and coaches that we work with, their kind of their base offer on this can often be like once a week phone call. So we've got, you know, we've got clubs that we work with that are doing kind of more community aspect and starting that funnel of working more in the community by just having, you know, um, either a one-to-one -one weekly call or a weekly Zoom community session where you can start to kind of drive awareness, build some of these conversations, even if in that early stages, you don't, you don't get stuck into the whole exercise prescription piece, um, which then obviously can create a bit of a funnel of interest to start to bring people more into the facility once there's a, like a, a level of communication established with you there already and once there's a level of relationship. Um, and there's definitely some value in creating that mix with the one-to-one -one and the, the group scenario, obviously I'm preaching to a converted ear, um, but especially in this, this context of COVID because 
these individuals feel so isolated, particularly as you said, JC, if they don't know that many other people that have been affected either. And they kind of feel like they're just being a bit of a pussy and is it just them? And like, they should just man up and get on with it. And a lot of people aren't telling people, you know, their husbands and wives and they don't want like the family to start panicking. They don't work to start panicking. So this whole kind of shame around it as well. Whereas if it's more familiar, and they're already in a safe space because, you know, they, particularly those that we already work with, you know, they already know you guys, then it starts to kind of break down a lot of barriers. And also last thing just on that, and then I'll shut up. Um, a lot of time we've experienced as a sector that people who need help, guidance and advice are often signposted to, to clinics and clinical practice environments. And there are obviously times and occasions when that's necessary, but often, we are as facilities able to to deliver that rehabilitation ourselves and you know, if it was any one of us and we were facing a difficult time i'm sure our preference would be to go and work with our coach at a facility where we already feel safe we already have a relationship that would be what we would prefer to do rather than go into this kind of sort of stale clinical environment so where we are going to have people in our communities who who have, say, for example, COVID rehab hubs, uh, rehab, rehab hubs, and I'm not griefing those, and they have a place, but those sorts of people, they if we can help them, then we should help them, and they would want us to help them. So that's also something to think about, depending on, on where you're based as well. But, but most, presumably, one of the biggest things we can do is, is help sort of build autonomy in the client and just help them manage themselves to a certain extent. A lot of the guys here will work with most of the most of the the memberships will be coaching based so they won't have gyms where people come in and do their own thing and kind of go haywire most of the um most of the gyms in here will be smaller groups so it's not that large boot camp style training which is sort of abs and megaphones and you know, a good shooting um so it, it should be all but for those that are completely buckled what we've got here is a real opportunity to help people within the system that was already there. Um, I love the idea, Carl, of sort of rebuild memberships and sort of foundational, fundamental health-based memberships. I think we've sort of lost, we've sort of moved too far away from what, what the client is in, in lots of cases. But there's a lot of, for most gyms in here, you, don't, you know, I'm not sure it's about a new layer of, of, of membership. It's actually about how do we you know, pre-screen people and how do we work with people within the context of our existing memberships um, mm -hmm. by giving them the infrastructure, the information, you know, making them more autonomous and building confidence in them about how they manage themselves. Mm. 100%. And that's what good coaching does. You know, we're, we're a gym that very much pride ourselves on our coaching first. We think that's what that separates us in our, in our local area. And that's what good coaching does. Good, you know, the, tragically, the best outcome of good coaching is that they don't need you anymore. You know, you, you almost kind of kill your own business, don't you? Cause you coach them so well that they're independent, but you know, that, that is what we should be looking at. And we should, and through doing that, we instill a confidence and an understanding and a knowledge in a person to be able to, to better cope and, and manage themselves. But if we do it right, and I think this is the case, then that makes them want to stay with us and learn more and develop more and, and benefit from that, that continued support and coaching. But that, that's 100% what it's about, is breeding, I guess, more common health vocabulary, letting people understand themselves better. Agreed. Um, oh, is that another question? I was just about to... It's a thank you for um, answering the question. Thanks, Alex. No bother. Very welcome. I'm conscious that we've run past the hour for everybody. I mean, it is Friday afternoon, beer o'clock. Um, we're... We're here if anybody has any questions after the fact, we'll make sure that JC gets all the resources that we referred to before. If there's any after questions, then I'm sure JC will, will get those to us or you can contact us directly by what you see on the screen. Um, anything else from you, JC or Cole? I guess from me, just say thank you. Thank you for the work. Uh, thank you for taking the time to come and present. Uh, and I'm sure it will, uh, it's definitely given me a stir and I'm sure for, for all the rest in the group, it's been, it will have been hugely valuable. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, mate. Um, thank you. Well, if you, if you need us, we'll pop back in a couple of months and give you an update on, on how things have changed with government and healthcare and in between time, keep in touch. Thanks, thank everyone. you again. Have a good weekend. Cheers, Carl. Cheers, Carl.